It was on 28th June 1914, the assassination of Archduke of Austria-Hungary, Franz Ferdinand and his pregnant wife Sophie, were killed at the hands of a Siberian nationalist, Gavrilo Prince Sipit, a member of a secret militant group known as the Black Hand. This incident began World War I, known as the Great War, which lasted for four dark years. What led to this assassination? The events that led to this war were blamed on the alliances between major powers in Europe by 1914. Those alliances resulted in six major groups divided into two major alliances. Group 1, Triple Intende, it was known as, and it included Great Britain, France, Russia, and Ireland. Group 2, the Central Powers, which included Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. As these countries came to each other's aid after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, their declarations of war on each other produced a domino effect, and thus, a month after the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, Austria-Hungary declares war on Siberia on the 28th of July 1914. Supporting Siberia, Germany declares war on Russia on the 1st of August 1914. Turkey signs a secret alliance treaty with Germany on the 2nd of August 1914. Germany declares war on France the 3rd of August 1914. Germany invades Belgium leading to Great Britain to declare war on Germany the 4th of August 1914 and on the 10th of August 1914 Austria-Hungary invades Russia. How did the Bahamas join the Great War and why did it join? It was on the 4th of August 1914 when the Bahamas entered the Great War due to its imperial power Great Britain who joined the war due to a treaty that it signed with Belgium in 1839. To protect and to defend Belgium's shipping ports that were geographically close to the coastline of Britain. Thus, when Germany invaded Belgium, Great Britain had to declare war on Germany due to its obligation to the Belgium Treaty of 1839. As this war raged in Europe, the Great Britain War Office was experiencing a slow decline in its soldiers and needed a quick solution to this problem. In 1915, the British West Indies Regiment was formed due to this drain of manpower. Thus, the London War Office began to accept volunteers from the British Commonwealth of Colonies. Some 16,000 men volunteered from the newly formed British West Indies Regiment and served on the West Front of France, in the Middle East, and in Africa. In the Bahamas, a call was made to young men between the ages of 18 through 24 to join the cause to fight a ruthless enemy against the crown. The enlistment of colonial volunteers in the Bahamas began in August of 1915 and between that year through 1917, Approximately 486 volunteers were dispatched to the British West Indies Regiment and the remainder joined the British Army, Canadian Forces and later the United States Army 
after that country joined the war. Approximately 700 Bahamian men participated in the First World War. Six Bahamians were killed in action. Three died from wounds and 28 from other causes. The Gallant 30. This was the very first group of young Bahamian volunteers who on the 9th of September 1915 set sail on a sloop known as the Veranda from Prince George Wharf after a parade in Rosson Square. They bid farewell to their native Bahamalan for more extensive preliminary training in Jamaica. Mrs. Gloria Knowles, now age 92, recalled as a teenager her father's military drill sessions at the Recreational Park in Nassau, Bahamas. I was born in Ragged Island on the 20th of May, 1926. My father's name was Clarence Nobile Moxie. He was born in Ragged Island on the 1st of October, 18. 97. On Remembrance Day, the ex servicemen assemble on the recreation ground to do their drill and march. And we all enjoyed that tremendously. I'm 92 years of age. Every cloud must have a silver lining. The honorary consul for the United Kingdom in the Bahamas, Mrs. Rosamond Roberts, gave the British Legion a military tour of her private archives of her grandfather, who served in World War I and her father in World War II. She was asked a question on how the involvement of both her grandfather and father made a difference in world freedom. And this was her response. The freedoms that... that they fought for came at a huge price mm -hmm. and unfortunately at the time between the two the first world war and the second world war there were a lot of mistakes made and mm -hmm. the history didn't really treat us kindly mm -hmm. yes it was it was it was a, a marvelous freedom to to have won the war and it was hoped that that would be the end of it all and that there would be no more world wars and we never have to go through it again. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the damage from the war was mm -hmm. too significant and Germany had suffered too much mm -hmm. and was rife for uh, another situation that led obviously inevitably to the Second World War. But actually, my, matern my paternal grandfather fought in both world wars wow. and he and my father both fought in the same regiment, mm -hmm. the Grenadier Guards. And that war, they both have very different war experiences, but it, it, I think the lessons from the First and Second World War were the more significant and that we should never, ever have that happen again. And I think that there was success in that respect. Germany had to 
understand that there was, you know, this was not, the behavior and so on was not appropriate and that they had to deal mm -hmm. with the way Europe was structured mm -hmm. to, to ensure the peace for the future and so that we've never had another world war on that scale ever again. So yes, something was achieved. But again, it came at yet another very huge price tag mm -hmm. and the wider world war that took it beyond the borders of Europe. I think it's a matter of, for me, it's a matter of great pride that they participated, that they had the courage to stand up for their country and fight for their country, give their country service to great cost to themselves. Um, I think that we need to cherish the history understand the history, that's the way we can avoid repeating the history. Um, I, you know, when you know your, your grandfathers and your father in later life, you don't know them as soldiers, you don't know what they've been through. Yeah. And it took a lot of time and over my lifetime to really learn with my sister and brother and I what exactly happened mm -hmm. and the sacrifices that were made. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that my children and my children's children and the wider scope of the children of the Bahamas and the world always will understand that there was a huge price and fighting to defeat fascism and Nazism was the key to sort of the stability of the world as it went forward from 1945. Um, what the Nazis did, their atrocities were so heinous and my father afterwards, after the war, was involved in some of the denazification and de sort of seeing what had happened and, and really understanding the length and breadth of what the Hitler regime perpetrated. And it was, I think it, it was just so shocking beyond shocking that the world will never go back to that place again and hopefully will have learned lessons. Mr. Pierre de Puch, son of a World War I hero, the late Sir Edian de Puch, a Bahamian son of the soil, was asked the question, how was the world a better place since his father's involvement in the Great War? And he replied. It's a very difficult question to answer. Oh. <laughs> I think that his, his participation in the world affairs, um, uh, in the armies, and the, what he, you know, uh, gave to the the allies during the war, and and uh, this sort of stuff. If you want to know what the what made him do all of these things, I, I, I was thinking about that. That's a very difficult question to answer, but you know, a man is a sum total of his experiences. Uh, he went away when he was 17 into the war. Uh, and that, I think he, that was the second time he tried. I think he tried when he was 16. And at 17, he fudged his age to, to 18 and then he went in. And uh, so at 17, can you imagine the psychological effect and a lasting effect it has on a person who's in trenches in those days with trench warfare. And the guy next to you is sticks his head up to see where the enemy is and seconds later his body comes back without a head wow. now what do you what what effect does this have on you um he had a lot of effect with meeting a whole pile of people different soldiers from india and he was able to find out how indians felt about being a colony for example and, and so the whole thing uh, his his association traveled really in meeting all these people and participating in all of these various things uh, was the essence of my father and uh, his dad dying when he was young and I think my grandfather died when he was 44 and my grandmother died when she was in her 30s and I think she died in childbirth um, so all of these things make the one the, the man and um, so he fought in the in the first world war he was a, he was a private uh, he tells only one nice story about the war. Most people who fight in wars don't talk about what they're doing because there's a lot of killing and all that sort of the gory stuff involved. But he, uh, do you believe in an afterlife, by the way? <laughs> huh? Okay. 
he says that uh, one day he was on point duty, you know, car duty, and he had pneumonia or something and he very, very sick. So he felt that he'd sit down in the trench and watch from the trench. Because in those days, if you found somebody on guard duty, he was sleeping, he just shot him, he didn't even wake him up. And dad says he sat down in the trench and he didn't realize that he passed out. And his mother, who had been dead years before that, he said his mother came and stood on the side of the trench and, and uh, reached out and took his hand and said, Eighteen, it's time to get up. He stood up, and just as he stood up, the, the people came around, the change of guard came around, and he only had, had a chance to say, halt who goes there, and passed out. The next time he, found, he, he woke up, he was in the hospital. So that's one of the, not funny things, it's one of the events that he talks about. But he never did talk about the, what he did in the war, other than meeting a lot of people, and, um, forming himself there with all the experiences that they had. And uh, he was lucky he came back here and all of that was formed by, you know, pulled together by his friend, Doc Father Chrysostom, which you, which you probably read about. But that was his, his life and his, his, the, the starting of the Tribune and everything else was service to people. And this is what he had around him all the time. That was his father's way, his, his mother's way. That was just the way. You know, this is the way we were brought up. And uh, so this was, this was the essence of the old man. And um, the, uh, we call, I call him the old man, we call him daddy. I'm 80 years old, I still call him daddy. But um, he's, uh, his second world war came, came about and he saw the need and he just filled it up. And uh, I assume, reading about it. I think I was, what, four years old or five years old at the time. Uh, but he had this tremendously large war materials operation going. And again, he bypassed all the powers to be and he went straight to the home office of the war office in England and did it. And the Bahamas was, was, became the second largest contributor in the entire British Empire wow. to the war effort. And his war, you know, everything they, they the scrap metal was used in England to build aircraft or, or boats or what have you. And the gold was melted down to, to, uh, to uh, uh, pay for bills and all sorts of stuff. So it was a tremendous thing. And he did canning. They opened up a canning factory and all the canning went to feed, feed the children who had been displaced a, in England. But he didn't do that for any, anything other than he found his institute. Um, he felt that he must do it. He should do it. And, and it had to be done. So he did it. And uh, that's the way he that's the way he operated. So the uh, the War Materials Committee uh, did a tremendous amount, and that is the things that spurred him on, I suppose, because he saw all the unfairness in the world and the unjust people in the world and what have you. And this he made up the man. He he would do it instinctively, not because he wanted anything for it. Uh, you know, sometimes people do things because they want something for it. He didn't want. He wanted nothing for it other than to, to to do it. His his whole his whole life in the Bahamas. It was um, a life of dedication to first of all the people of the Bahamas and dedication to his. He loved the British Empire. I mean, he uh, and he felt that it was his duty was to do what he could, as he did when he was seventeen years old. And um, I can I go back to. Uh, if you can imagine what, what was going through a 17-year-old's mind when all of this stuff was thrown in his face, basically, and it had an impression on him. Uh, he always said, even to us, that, you know, that every one of us was six children. Every one of us was shipped out of this country when we were 14 years old. And he said the reason for it, we went to school, right? the reason for it was that the traveling and meeting people and interacting with people made you understand how other people think. And consequently, if particularly if you're in public life, you can react properly with them. And, and this is this happened to all six of us. And I think it's, it was a tremendous experience. And I think he had the same sort of thing, you know. And so that's about all I could say about it, you know. Is,
and the country found them ready at the stirring call for men. Let no tears add to their hardships as the soldiers pass along. And although you during the war, many civic groups were organized in the Bahamas. The Imperial Order of the Daughters of the Empire was formed in 1901, but assisted in collecting thousands of pieces of warm garments for our men. The Bahamas Red Cross Guild was formed in 1915 to collect money and foodstuffs for the war relief efforts. The Bulgarian Relief Fund, under the chairmanship of Ms. Mary Mosley, was formed to specifically assist with the unfortunate Bulgarian people who were invaded by Germany and suffered hunger and devastation, leaving a dramatized generation overturned all empires and changed in the world's political order forever. Approximately 15,600 men from the British West Indies colonies served in this war for a cause they could not understand, but they bravely answered that call. We will remember them. We must remember them. Though your lands are far away, the dream of home, there's a silver lining through the dark cloud shining. Turn the dark cloud inside out till the morning.